sound check. Can we all see the, the screen? We all see the screen? Awesome. All right. So I'll get to start. Okay, so good afternoon to everyone online. Uh, thanks for joining us on this rather gloomy, but I'll say uh, rather perfect weather for an indoor online seminar. So for all the new students and parents, uh, welcome to Open Wisdom Education. And for all the returning students and parents, welcome back. It's great to see all of your, your names popping up on the screen to bring back a bit of energy back into the day. So. Today is part of our Open Wisdom Compass series titled Onwards and Upwards, A Guide to Year 11 and 12. Uh, it's designed for Year 9 and Year 10 students about to start arguably two of the most challenging years of their high school journey. The rationale behind this seminar, we believe, during this year, given the health crisis and the lack of exposure to uh, school guidance as a tuition center, we believe it is imperative to provide our students with the clarity and the confidence that you all need before starting next year. Now, I'll go through a few housekeeping rules before we start. Uh, number one, uh, can we all please mute ourselves to avoid any background noise? Number two, uh, if for any given uh, unforeseen circumstances that this call drops, do not be alarmed, just entering the same meeting ID and the passwords, you'll be reconnected. Third housekeeping rule. We have a very dense uh, schedule for today. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask, feel free to type your question in the bottom right corner. At the end of the session, we'll dedicate some time to answer each one of your questions. And lastly, uh, I believe there's a fair number of parents online. Uh, if you need, uh, Chinese assistance, uh, I'll be more than happy to stay after the session to answer all your questions in Chinese. So do not be alarmed. So today's session will be broken up into three main parts. We'll be going through the New South Wales Year 11 and 12 progression, as well as the idea of uh, subject scaling. And then our panel of our tutors will be going through a number of the popular subjects and lastly, we'll be going through our method of success, which sometimes we call the open wisdom way of tuition. So let's start with part one. Now, by this stage, you'll be wondering who is this crazy person sitting right here telling us what to do with our year 11, 12. So a quick introduction about myself. Uh, my name is James. I achieved an ATAR of 99.65 received the New South Wales Premier's Medal, as well as the New South Wales University AAA Scholarship. I completed a double degree in laws and civil engineering, graduating in honours. When we founded Open Wisdom Education, we had a clear vision of our unique way of uh, tuition that will provide an alternative pathway to our students. So from a bigger uh, point of view, uh, I believe uh, this is a very good starting point to start our discussion. Now, for year 11 and 12, uh, the progression is quite different to year 7 to year 10. Now, year 11 uh, has only three terms. Uh, the last term of uh, this calendar year will be the first term of your year 12 journey. Now, if you're currently in year 11, which means that your HSC will be in 2022, Right now, you're almost done with your year 11 uh, year. Now, if you're currently in year 10, your HSC year will be in 2023. And if you count the number of months until uh, October 2022, we're only looking at about 12 to 13 months before you officially start your year 12 journey. Now, I would like to uh, tie in some of the common questions throughout the presentation. So the, one of the most commonly asked questions from students, parents, is that does my kid's year 11 mark count towards year 12? So as you can see at the bottom of this slide, very clearly, your year 11 marks do not count towards your year 12 ATAR calculation. Only the marks that you receive in year 12 will count towards your year 12 ATAR calculation. 
The next slide will be going through some of the NESA top line guide for year 11 preliminary subject selection. Now, I believe many of us have already chosen our subjects, but up until the start of year 11, all students have the ability to modify and change your subjects. So for a year 11 student, you must complete 12 units before starting year 12. The 12 units must contain at least two units of English and four different subjects. So if we take an example, a student may choose two units of advanced English, three units of maths, which is extension one maths, two units of chemistry, two units of physics, two units of modern history, and two units of business studies. That's a total of 13 units. For reference sake, most subjects are two units, uh, except for math extension, English extension, as well as a year 12 science extension. After you complete year 11, you go into year 12. Now for year 12, uh, you will only need 10 units as a minimum to complete the HSC. Out of the 10 units, just like year 11, two out of the 10 has to be English and they have to be four different subjects. A year 12 student at this stage may choose to add or remove subjects from your choice of subjects in year 11 to give you the best chance of success in the HSC exam. But note it, you cannot start a subject fresh in year 12. You have to continue with the subjects you already picked in year 11 by making some minor adjustments. When you, when you complete your HSC exam, NESA will only take the top 10 units to determine your ATAR. So if we use an, uh, an example again, this student in year 11 has picked 13 units. Another commonly asked question from the parents and students is, should I do 10 units for the HSC or should I do 11 or more units for HSC? So in this, in this example, this student may choose to do 12 units for HSC. Now, what this student did was that uh, uh, this student dropped the extra unit of maths, but maintained all the subjects the same. Alternatively, this student may choose to do 10 units for HSC. Now, what this student did was not only this student dropped the two units of modern history, the student also dropped the two units of business studies. But in exchange, this student has taken up four unit maths, which, which is extension two maths. Now in this table, we pretty much summarizes some of the top line pros and cons in choosing 10 units or 11 or more units. So if we look at the 10 units side of the table, the benefits of doing 10 units in HSC is that uh, you're more focused. You can spend all the time in your entire year of year 12 to focus on the subjects that will give you the highest mark. So it's very efficient. But the problem with 10 units is that it's very risky because the, all the 10 units that you do will count towards your ATAR. On the flip side, if you choose to do 11 or 12 units, it's less risky, which is a plus, which is a benefit because you have two extra units as a backup. But the issue with doing 11 or 12 units is that it's quite inefficient because you need to spend time on this last subject, last extra one or two units, but it does not necessarily mean that it will count towards your final ATAR calculation. Now, as a center, we're not saying you have to do one or the other, but if we look at this table, this table is from the NESA report. When we look at this from a bigger picture, it will give us a better understanding on whether you should pick 10, 11, or 12. So in 2020, as you can see, 49.3% of the uh, HSC candidates have picked 10 units. 16.8 have picked 11 units, 10.7 picked 12 units. Now, at this stage, some of the students and parents are still asking, so what do you think as a center, what should we do? So if we were to give a recommendation, if you picked subjects that's more tilted towards maths, chemistry, physics, um, we recommend you 
go to HSC with 10 units because the exams question that they ask you all come from syllabus. Once you memorize and then can apply the syllabus dot points, you'll ace your HSC. However, if the choice of subject you picked for year 11, 12 are more geared towards the humanities, such as uh, history, or even the ones that require major work, such as music or visual arts, we recommend you pick 11 or 12 units because there's a high level of subjectivity in marking your major work. Now, a quick touch uh, on the year 12 HSC progression is that you'll be doing four assessments in year 12 and the final HSC exam. The thing I really would like to highlight in this slide is this. From year seven to year 10, uh, a lot of parents uh, really care about the, the class exams. Now, as you start year 11, 12, the only things that matter in calculating your final ATAR, your HSC, will be the assessments. In year 12, you'll be completing four assessments throughout the year, and the four assessments together will give you a subject ranked internally. And then you will be completing an actual HSC exam, which this year has been postponed, but it will still be completed. What's going to happen is that your actual HSC mark will be determined by an average of your HSC assessment mark and your HSC exam mark. Now, the, as you can see on the slide, uh, your subject rank affects the HSC assessment mark as well as the actual HSC exam. Now, this is a very complex idea, which we have a part two, which we'll be going through in term one of next year, where we'll go into very much details on how this actually works. But for today's sake, for all the year 10 students and parents, we just need to know that your HSC mark is an average of your HSC assessment mark and the HSC exam mark. Now, the third commonly asked question from our uh, parents is that sometimes a bit unsure the difference between HSC and ATAR. Now, HSC is what we call a subject mark. ATAR on the other side is a rank and NESA uses ATAR to determine university admission. If we use this student, for example, this student has completed five different subjects and this student will receive five HSC mark, one mark for each subject. What's, what's then gonna happen is that all the HSC marks will be added together which will give you an aggregate mark out of 500. Now, in this example, this student has achieved an aggregate mark of 412 out of 500. Using this aggregate mark, they will convert this into an ATAR, which is a rank. Now, you might be interested to know what is sort of the aggregate marks that I need for different uh, tiers of ATAR. So in this table, We've summarized it for you. If you achieve an aggregate of 450 out of 500, you'll be getting an ATAR of 99.1. This was from the table released in 2020 HSE result from NESA, uh, from UAC. Now, if you go down, if you achieve the aggregate mark of 300, you will be getting an ATAR of 76.85. And then if you achieve an aggregate of 150, you'll be getting an ATAR of 44.7. Now, we're moving on to the next uh, element of this first part, which is the idea of subject scaling. Now, subject scaling is an extremely complex uh, methodology, but for today's benefit, we will tell you the top line uh, points that you will take away, and that will help you to, de to determine what are the subjects that are most suitable for you. So a few of the questions that pop up for our students are, does subject scaling really matter? The second question they might ask is, I thought all subjects are treated the same. Or some other students might like to ask, well, I should be doing easy subjects to get a high ATAR. Whereas some other students might like to say, 
I should be doing challenging subjects to get a high ATAR. They're all valid questions. But I will tell you a bit about this from an objective, unbiased lens. So if we look at this table, okay, it's quite interesting. It's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit convoluted, but I'll take you through it, okay? So this is the table 4.6, which is the 10 most common HSC courses and result achieved by students within a specific ATAR range. Now, the ATAR range I picked for this example is a typical student who achieved an ATAR around 99 to 99.95, which are situated in the very top band. Now, when, I'm not saying that you should pick the subjects, but they will provide a good reference for us to, to think about. So if these people did really well for HSC, what did they actually pick for their subjects? So as you can see very clearly, the top five subjects they picked were English Advanced, 83% of the people picked that. Three unit maths, which is mathematics extension one. Again, 83% of the people picked that. They also picked extension two maths, which is four, uh, mathematics uh, four unit maths. They also picked chemistry. They also picked physics. What do we know? This is the Asian combo, which many students have talked about. And again, the data does not lie they all picked these subjects. I'll show you something even more interesting. So instead of looking at the people that gets the highest ATAR, let's compare the students across different ATAR range. Let's look at the, the most popular subject, which is obviously English because everyone has to pick two units of English. For a typical student who achieved an ATAR of 99, they picked advanced English, who achieved an ATAR around 90, picked also advanced English, but between 70 to 79 have picked English standard. And then we look at the other subjects. We've gone through the Asian combo for 99 to 99.5. And then we look at the popular subjects for someone with an ATAR range between 90. They picked biology, uh, advanced maths, which is two in a maths, three in a maths, as well as chemistry. So a bit of difference there. And then we look at the third type, which is the 70 range, they picked subjects uh, such as standard maths, biology, and business studies. Again, there's, we're looking at this from an unbiased objective lens, but they will provide a good reference for you to think about the subjects that you should be picking for year 11 and 12. I'll give you the last example, okay? Now, as you can see, I'm, I'm I'm quite a numbers driven person. Um, quite a, I like to use numbers to tell you a story. So we take this student, for example. This student has picked the uh, typical Asian combo subject, the high scaling subject, advanced English, three in, a, uh, three in a maths, four in a maths, physics and chemistry. Now, hypothetically say, this student achieved a HSE mark of 90 across all the subjects the estimated ATAR is around 98.2. If we take the second student, student B, that student picked English standard, general maths, biology, business studies, and legal studies, also getting uh, 90 for all the subjects, this student would get an estimated ATAR of 94.55, which is only a difference of four ATAR points roughly. Now, do you think it's easy to get 90 for each HSC um, subject. It's incredibly hard because if you do achieve 90 for every single subject, you will be on the New South Wales all-rounders list, which is an amazing achievement for a student. However, if we look at an average sort of result, again, using student A, that student has picked advanced English and all the high-scaling subjects but got 80, the estimated ATAR would be around 89.7. I'll give everyone a few seconds to think about what would student B get by choosing those middle sort of mid moderately scaled subject and getting 80 for all the subjects. Have a think about it. If 
the result will surprise you because this student would only get an ATAR of 77, which means that there's a difference of almost 12 ATAR points. Now, 12 ATAR points means that if you apply to a University of New South Wales or UCID, you'll be missing out on a lot of uh, university admission uh, degrees. So another thing for you to think about. So in summary, okay, we believe as a center, scaling only contributes one third of the overall story, okay? We believe there's three key elements for you to think about when you're choosing the subjects for year 11 and 12. Number one, you have to think about your interests. Be you ask yourself, do I enjoy learning about this subject? Okay? And then you think about the skill. Are you skilled in this subject? Are you good at it? And lastly, with these two uh, ideas down pat, we then look at scaling. Does this subject scale relatively well? And the overlap of these three elements will be a good indicator for a subject that's suitable for you for year 11 and 12. And I believe that pretty much summarizes my part, but then there's a few other frequently asked questions I'll be quickly going through now. Number one, what's the benefit of picking three unit maths over two unit maths? Now, the benefit of that is it scales better. Second, does my school directly affect ATA calculation? This is a very complex question, but if we look at it from the surface, your school does not directly affect your ATA calculation. But what it matters is the subject rank within your school that matters. I'll be going through that in details next year in the part two series, so stay tuned. The third question. Will I definitely get a low ATAR if I choose a low scaling subject? The answer is no. As you can see in the example above, if you get a very high HSC mark for all your subjects, your ATAR will be very high. It's only when you cho you've chosen the low scaling subject and getting a low HSC mark, your ATAR will be punished. Fourth question, do I get a better ATAR if I study more units? The answer is no. You do not get a better ATAR if you study more units. And I would like to argue many of the top students in HSC did only 10 units and uh, they also achieved a great result. Lastly, should I trust and use the ATAR calculators that I find on Google? The answer is yes, you should trust it. But if you do not know how it works, don't use it because it will give you a very skewed perception on your performance. Okay, so I have officially fi finished my part. I'll pass it on to our panel of experienced tutors to go through some of the popular subjects. I'll pass it on to Winnie. Hi everyone, can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me well? Okay, awesome. Um, so we're just gonna start off here. So I'll be talking about stage six English, just a brief overview of what stage is stage six English is like. So who am I? Uh, my name is Winnie. Uh, when I graduated, I got an ATAR of 98.4. I was also an all round achiever. That means I got band six in all my subjects, which is a 19 above. I'm also the senior manage, manager of the English faculty here at Open Wisdom. Uh, I currently study Bachelor of Arts and Education at UNSW. That means um, I'm a history and Chinese teacher. So I've done most of my degree. I'm about to graduate. I've also had five years teaching experience here at Open Wisdom. Now, today I'll just be going through the most popular stage six English subjects. As we can see, you can choose extension two English, extension one English, advanced English, standard, EALD and English studies, but today I'll just be going through the most popular English subjects, which are advanced English, standard English, and EALD. Now, just beginning with advanced English, I'm just going to go through what the year 11 course is like and what the 
year 12 courses like. So for all our English subjects, actually for year 11, there's no uh, prescribed text list. So you will just kind of see what the uh, course structure is like, but there's no specific list of year 11 uh, texts. So in year 11, you'd go through a module called Common Module, which is called Common Module because both English Advanced and English Standard study this module. Then you do Mod A and then Mod B. Now, I know this probably means nothing. So a good thing to do right now is probably maybe talk to a year 11 student, ask them what text your the school does, and maybe have a look through those texts before you get started with year 11. And then in year 12, there is a prescribed text list. And again, it's probably nice to talk to some year 12s and ask them, well, what text are we studying in the school? So the topics in year 12 are common module. Again, it's called common module because English Standard do it, English Advanced do it, and EALD do it. Now, even though all three English levels do it, the content you study is different and the way the teacher marks the essay and the requirements, of course, will be different. It's just that the umbrella topic is the same. And then we've got mod A, mod B, and mod C. Now mod C again, it's a topic where English advanced and English standard do. So all we can see is there's a lot of uh, commonalities between English advanced and standard. Now, what does the HSC exam look like? For English, okay, only for English, there's the exam is held over two days. Okay, so we've got paper one on day one. And then we've got paper two on day two. And then on day one, you'll do this exam, which goes on for 90 minutes. And then you come back the next day and do your two hour exam, which is the second part of English. So section one, reading comprehension, section two, an essay. Uh, and then your next three sections on the next day. You now probably doesn't mean, they don't mean too much right now, but they will mean a lot when you start your HSC course. Now, this is the English standard overview. Again, that common module, which both uh, English advanced and standard do. Mod A and mod B are different to English advanced. And then in year 12, again, those common modules, common module, text and human experiences, mod A, B and C. So what I'm trying to highlight is that there are many similarities between English advanced and English standard. And we'll discuss the ins and outs of that a bit later. So we can help you decide which course you'd want to choose, advanced or standard. So once again, the English exam is held over two days, uh, paper one and paper two. Now with paper one, it looks very similar to the English advanced. Now that's because the exam is also very similar. With the reading section, they're actually overlapping questions. Um, some questions are common and with the human experience essay, the essay question is actually exactly the same. It's exactly the same for English advanced and English standard. Then on day two, you have the three sections again. Now, again, I said just then mod C was exactly the same. Uh, the question is different on the day of the HSC. So the only thing that's common between advanced and standard in the HSC is your human experience essay. But then of course, the way the teacher marks the essay will be different because the criteria is slightly different. The expectation is gonna be different. And then another very popular course that law students choose is also EALD. Now there's a special requirement for EALD and that is it's only available for students who have been educated overseas or in an Australian educational institute with English as a language of instruction for five years or less. Okay, so you must have been here for five years or less. So you can't say, oh, I came here when I was in year three. Can I choose EALD? Okay, so unlikely. So it's only for people who've been here for five years or less. Uh, this is the course structure for EALD. Uh, you can see the, the uh, the topics that are done are completely different to advanced and standard, but then in year 12, you again have that text and human experience, which you do, uh, which advanced and standard do. But then, of course, again, the criteria, the expectations, the text that you do are also completely different. The exam is also held over two days. Okay, now um, 
day one, paper one, human experience again, and then day two, the other modules. There's one extra bit though in ELD, and that is they have a listening task, a listening section. So that's distinctive to EALD students. They've got an additional section on day two where they have to listen to a recording and answer the appropriate questions. So the question comes as, well, since English standard and advanced are so similar, which one should I choose? Now, these are some questions we should ask ourselves when thinking about whether we should choose English advanced and standard. Now, I think the most uh, interesting difference would be English standard that they don't study Shakespeare. So if you're not a huge fan of Shakespeare, you're not a huge fan of going very deep into a text and looking at the complex ideas, then English standard is the choice. Whilst if you really like literature, you really like writing, and you also want to think about doing extension one and two in the future, then maybe choose advance. So look at the difference. This one is I'm definitely aiming to go to university, whilst English standard is I'm just planning to go to university. And you do, the teacher does expect more independent learning with English advance. And then there's an additional um, option in year 11. So starting from year 11, you can choose extension one. Okay, you can, you can do advanced English and extension one, which is on top of your advanced English. Now this is for people who are actually very passionate about English. You actually plan on studying humanities or literature in university. So you plan on studying history or English in university. Now, extension one English does require a lot of independent learning. You don't receive as much help as you do in advanced English and uh, English standard. The teacher does expect that you're already very good at English and she or he's just gonna help you slightly to build on your skills. So extension one English is for students who are very passionate about English. Now, if you're super passionate and you think, oh, extension one's not even enough, you can also choose extension two English in year 12. Okay, that's a subject that's only available in year 12, extension two English. Now, other things we should consider when choosing courses, as James talked about, is scaling. <laughs> now, if you just have a look at these statistics, again, using statistics to tell stories, uh, we can see that so this is the number of students who've chosen English standard. This is their median mark. This is how many of the percentage of students get band six. And what we can see from this graph is uh, if you do English, people do English advanced, there's more people who get band six compared to people who do English standard. And that's usually the reason why we all try to go for English advanced compared to English standard. And again, look at the band five, there's 49% of people who do advanced get band five, whilst only 11% of students to do English standard get the band five. So it's a lot harder to squish into the band five and six when you do English standard compared to English advanced. Again, this is just something to look at. It's not a determining factor. If you really hate English, then I really don't suggest that you choose English advanced. So I'm just gonna answer some common misconceptions and FAQs. Question one is, I shouldn't choose English standard because it doesn't scale well. Now, that's something just to consider. Scaling is just something to consider. Uh, to be very honest with you, if you're not going to do well and you're going to fail in that subject, scaling is not going to save you. All right. So if you, you try your hardest and the best you can do is get like a band three, band four mark, then scaling is not going to save you. So again, choose the subjects, choose the subjects that you're more passionate about and you're more confident about because if you're going to do bad, scaling is not going to help you at all. Another thing is, uh, should I buy study guides uh, for English? Uh, I do recommend study guides. However, it pick and choose your study guides. Uh, I personally really like ATAR notes. I think their study guides are done very well because they discuss the text conceptually. So pick study guides that discuss the text conceptually and in depth. We have free spark notes and cliff notes online. So why buy study guides that are similar to those, right? So look through the study guides and think, oh, does it discuss the text in depth? Is it very complex, the ideas it discusses? Does it go very nuanced? Rather than, oh, is this something I can just find on spark notes online? 
And the last question is a question a lot of students have. They think, oh, I really hate English. Everything is subjective. The teacher is very judgmental. He or she just doesn't like my essay because they, they didn't like my ID or they don't like who I am. Now, that is true. English, history, all these humanities, they are rather subjective uh, topics and subjects that when we write our essays, we think the teacher's just judging me. But at the same time, uh, you can work on English, you can work on the structure, you can work on the way you express your ideas. There's highly likely your teacher doesn't like your essay or doesn't like your story or your creative writing is because the idea is very cliche. Because teachers, they've seen so many essays in their life. So highly likely they haven't marked your essay very well because they think it's cliche or the idea you've used is very old and you haven't expressed your idea very well. So yes, English is subjective, but that doesn't mean you should give up and not study for it because there's always room for improvement, always ways to improve on our writing. And just to wrap up, I'll be going through some band six tips and tricks just to think about when you're going to year 11 and year 12. Uh, tip number one is, well, whenever we go to an exam in year 11 and 12, always be prepared. That means memorize your essays. But a little bit more than that. Now, most of our teachers tell us don't memorize your essay because you're not going to answer the question. You're going to end up just writing your essay. That's true. And that's why I said, and that's why I'm saying we should memorize your essay, but do a bit more than that. Think of your essay like a Lego, a Lego figure. It's comprised of bits and pieces. On the day of the exam, you're going to have to remove some pieces and put in pieces from the question. Okay, so think of your essay like a Lego model. You're going to have to take out Lego pieces and you're going to have to replace them with what's been asked in the question. So definitely memorize your essay so you have something to fall back on, but don't entirely rely on that essay that you've memorized. You'll definitely, definitely have to adapt that essay to the question on the spot. Tip two, from description to analysis to synthesis, as students who have a tendency to describe the text, we love talking about what the text is about, we love talking about what the movie is about, what the novel is about, but we really have to move away from that in year 11 and 12. We're going to move into the world of analysis, which is thinking about the message behind the text. Right? What is this text trying to teach me? What am I learning from this text rather than what is this text about? Because what the text is about is something which is, we can just get from Wikipedia. Right? That doesn't show your understanding of the text. But when you start interpreting the text, start thinking about the message behind the text, like what the text is trying to teach me, that's when you show a personal voice, a personal understanding of the text. So in year 11 and 12, in order to move into the higher bands, we're going to move away from description, move into analysis and synthesis. What is the message behind the text? What can I learn from this text? And at the end of the day, why am I learning this text? So showing that you understand why you're learning Shakespeare or why you're learning a movie. And then lastly, uh, be well read, meaning listen to podcasts about Shakespeare's plays. Watch some TED Ed videos, right? Look at how other people have analyzed the text. Right? You don't always have to rely on yourself and what your teacher said. Look at how other people do it. Right? Learn from other people because to be very honest, other people out there probably have a lot greater ideas than we do. So learn from other people, read widely, listen to podcasts, watch more videos online, and look at how other people analyze and appreciate literature. Yep, and that's all for me. All right, thank you, Winnie. Um, that was very, very insightful. I'll pass it on to uh, Sharon, who will be going through some of the mathematics side of the things. Right. Uh, thank you, James. Thank you, Winnie. Uh, just an audio check. Audio is all right. Everyone can hear me. Okay, nice. So um, now we're going to move on to the mathematics portion of today's um, seminar. Sorry, some technical difficulties, I think. Ah, okay, all good. So uh, a bit about myself. Um, I received an ATAR of 99 and I started working um, at Open Wisdom back in 2018. So I have around four years of tutoring experience under my belt. Um, I'm also a senior manager um, here at Open Wisdom for the maths and science team. And I'm currently completing a bachelor of law and economics at UNSW. 
So um, moving on to an overview of the available subjects uh, for maths in stage six. So you can choose um, extension two mathematics, extension one, advanced, standard two, and standard one. Uh, but for today, uh, we're going to be focusing on the two most popular subjects for year 11, which is advanced mathematics and extension one mathematics. So this is the course outline for uh, mathematics advanced for year 11 and year 12. Um, so in year 11, you work on functions, trigonometric functions, calculus, and combina uh, matrix. Sorry, uh, I just say comms. <laughs> so um, in year 12, uh, you can see that we build on the knowledge in year 11 with uh, proof, vectors, trig functions, calculus, and um, statistical analysis. So you can see that there's quite, actually, there's quite a lot of um, overlap between the year 11 course and the year 12 course. Um, so uh, please make sure to pay attention in year 11 and you know, don't throw out the notes that you uh, have in year 11 because they are essential to your success. Um, in year 12. So how is the mathematics advanced uh, exam structured? So um, it's one exam, so not like English where there's two, there's only one for an, uh, mathematics advanced. Uh, it is quite a long exam, so three hours, um, and it's broken up into two sections. The first section being uh, 10 multiple choice questions, and then the second section consisting of sort of free response, uh, short answer maths questions consisting of 90 marks. So moving on to um, extension one maths or three unit maths. Uh, so the core structure um, for year 11 is uh, functions, trigonometric functions, calculus and um, comms. So very similar to um, year 11 advanced uh, mathematics. Um, but then in year 12, it again builds on that knowledge from year 11. Um, into proof, vectors, trig functions, calculus, and um, statistical analysis. So again, there's a lot of overlap between year 11 and year 12. So um, do make sure to pay attention in year 11 and, and keep your knowledge from year 11 and, and use it in year 12. Um, and so, yeah, moving on to the uh, exam. So the three unit or mathematics extension one exam is slightly shorter, two hours. Um, and has 10 multiple choice questions and a free response uh, comprising of 60 marks. Now, you might be thinking, why is the extension exam shorter than the advanced exam? So this is because students that take um, extension one maths, they actually take both the advanced course and the extension one course together. So um, in total, that is three units. So um, on the day uh, during your HSC, you will be actually, if you're doing extension one, you'll be doing two exams. So you'll be doing the same advanced exam as the advanced students, but also you'll be doing this additional two hour exam for your um, extension one uh, unit. So which course should I choose? Yeah, so should you choose mathematics advanced or should you choose uh, mathematics extension one? So. Uh, this guide aims to help with your decision as to whether to choose um, advanced or extension one. So I'm just going to point out some of the main ones. So if you plan to study a degree at uni that has a very strong focus on maths, so for example, um, engineering, uh, actuarial studies, advanced science, um, it is recommended that you do extension one. Um, uh, otherwise, advanced mathematics is usually sufficient for other sort of business related uh, degrees like commerce or um, even education as well, if that's what you're interested in. Um, as I mentioned before, um, Extension 1 students, they have to take on extra workload in addition to the workload for advanced. OK, so you will essentially be doing two exams for mathematics if you choose to uh, do Extension 1. And so you do need to enjoy maths to some extent because you're going to be doing a lot of work on it um, and a lot of independent study. So if you feel comfortable uh, juggling the um, two workloads, then extension one is definitely uh, recommended for you. So some common misconceptions and frequently asked questions. So the first one is, um, I did well in year 10 maths. Does that mean I will naturally ace year 11 maths? So this is partially true, partially false. Um, it definitely helps if you are on top of your uh, year 10 content because it, um, it, uh, it provides an important sort of foundation uh, for the topics you will learn in senior school. But um, if you notice the topics themselves are very different uh, from year 10. So 
um, you know, avoiding burnout is, is very, very important in senior school. So it's not, you know, necessarily guarantee that you're going to do exceptionally well in year 11 and 12 if you did well in year 10. Um, so the second one is I have way too much homework and not enough time to do it. So what should I do? So what I usually suggest to my students is um, to do the uh, first column and the last column of the textbook questions you are assigned. So what this does is that it ensures that you have a sort of basic understanding of the fundamental concepts, but you can also do the more complex uh, calculations at the end. So this essentially sort of covers the entire spectrum of difficulty. And then for the third one, uh, mathematics is relatively straightforward to study for because most, if not all, the assessments are timed exams. So this is pretty true, yeah? So preparing for maths assessments is quite straightforward. Um, and I'll actually be going through uh, that um, in the band six uh, tips and tricks. So first thing is past papers are your best friend. So um, the best way to prepare for maths exams is past papers. Now, there is a huge difference between textbook questions and exam style questions. So in the two weeks sort of leading up to your exam, you really wanna be mainly focusing on past papers. Um, rather than textbook questions, because textbook questions you would have done already as the homework that your teacher sets for you throughout the year. Um, so exam questions are generally a lot more vague and a lot more word focused, a lot more wordier than um, textbook questions, and they can also test you on multiple concepts in one question. So you really need to be doing past papers uh, to sort of develop and hone those skills. Um, the second tip is that um, timing is key. Okay, so three hours or two hours, depending on, you know, which uh, level of maths you take, it can seem like quite a lot of time, you know, especially that at three uh, hour uh, advanced exam, but it actually goes by very, very quickly. So you need to be able to not only complete questions accurately, but fast enough so that you can actually complete the paper in time. And ideally you actually want time left over so that you can go back and check your um, answers uh, or go back to questions that you, that you skipped. Um, it's also very important to do uh, as many past papers as you can in exam conditions to best sort of replicate the day of the exam um, because you wanna make sure that you can actually stay concentrated and focused throughout that entire two hour or three hour uh, time period rather than breaking it up um, because that's not, that's not, uh, that's not what's gonna happen on the day of the exam. Yep, and that's it from me. And I will now pass on to Irene. All right, thank you, Sharon, for the knowledge, love the energy. And now we'll pass it on to Irene to give us an overview on physics and chemistry. Okay, thank you, James. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay, perfect. So hello, everyone. I'm just going to talk to you about physics and chemistry in year 11 and 12. Oh, James, I think you was there. Yep. Okay, perfect. So my name is Irene. I graduated with an ATA of 99.4. Um, I was DAX of my high school, and I was also on the all-rounder list. I have been teaching open wisdom education for about two and a half years now in science and maths, and I am studying optometry at uh, the University of New South Wales. So why should you choose physics and chemistry in year 11 and 12? Physics and chemistry are actually really common prerequisites for uni, um, especially for uh, degrees like science, health and engineering. So if you're interested in one of those degrees, you should absolutely pick physics and chemistry. Um, and even if you don't know what you want to do at uni, it's a good idea to still pick them because they are really common. Um, physics and chemistry also help you understand how the world works. So they are very interesting subjects and they can also help you refine your critical thinking skills and also the way that you analyze different concepts. So for physics uh, in year 11, this is what we will cover. Um, first, you will cover kinematics, which is motion in one direction. Dynamics is how forces interact with motion. Waves and thermodynamics and electricity and magnetism. 
And then in year 12, the content that you cover builds on the knowledge that you uh, got in year 11. So advanced mechanics is related to kinematics and dynamics. Electromagnetism is related to module four from year 11. Um, in module seven, you will look at some of Einstein's theories and module eight from the universe to the atom. Now for chemistry, in year 11, uh, you will learn about properties and structure of matter, um, introduction to quantitative chemistry, which is, um, you, you're going to learn about calculations in this module, then reactive chemistry and drivers of reactions. And then in year 12, you will learn about equilibrium and acid reactions, acids and bases, organic chemistry, and applying chemical ideas. So in module eight, you will essentially apply different principles that you've learned to analyze certain chemicals. So as you can see, all of the content in both chemistry and physics in year 12 continues from the content that you learned in year 11. So it is really important to keep your notes um, and don't forget what you learned. So how is the HSC exam structured? Both chemistry and physics exams are structured the same way. So both of them are three hours with five minutes reading time. Um, section one has 20 marks, uh, so 20 multiple choice questions, and section two has short answer questions, and they are worth 80 marks in total. Um, so now some common misconceptions and FAQs. So first of all, chemistry and physics are easy marks because they scale well. This is something that a lot of students believe, um, but this is not actually true. So physics and chemistry scale well because they're actually some of the most difficult subjects in the HSC. Um, but that being said, they're only as easy as you're willing to make them for yourself. So if you put in a lot of effort and you study frequently, um, you're going to do quite well and the scaling is going to help you. That being said, if you don't like physics and chemistry, if you're not interested, you're probably not going to put a lot of effort into learning. Them. And scaling is not going to help you much. So if that's the case, you should probably pick another subject that you're more interested in. Um, then. The second one, all I have to do to get high marks is memorize the content. In both physics and chemistry, they ask you to apply concepts that you've learned. So you have to actually apply your knowledge. You cannot just recall information because you're not going to get the full marks. And I don't need a good understanding of maths to succeed in, phys in physics and chemistry. Um, so although you know, chemistry is about 30% maths, physics is more than 30%. And although the formulas that they give you are quite simple, so they're quite simple to apply. Um, there are some concepts that you learn in advanced maths. Um, they're actually going to help you understand the content a lot easier. For example, calculus, graphs, logs, um, they, they're really going to help you understand physics and chemistry more. Um, so now for some tips and tricks. Tip one, the syllabus is your best friend. So you can find the syllabus for chemistry and physics online. Um, they break down everything that you need to know by module and by into, into dot points. So it's really important that you follow the syllabus closely when you study and when you revise to make sure that you don't miss anything that you need to know. Then two, use active recall, spaced repetition and practice questions instead of rewriting notes. So when you study, um, the point is to take information from your textbook and into your long-term memory. When you rewrite notes or when you reread a paragraph until you understand it, that doesn't actually help you remember something long term. So what you need to do instead is you need to use active recall where you explain the content that you're looking at without looking at your notes. So that requires you to have quite substantial understanding of the content. Um, then spaced repetition is extremely important. You can see the graph um, on the slide. It shows you how much information you retain after a certain amount of days of learning it. So when you revise one, three, and six days after learning something, you can see that you're much less likely to forget it. Um, so it goes into your long-term memory. Um, and then after six days, you can revise every week or so, or every two weeks. So a way that you can practice spaced repetition and active recall at once is using flashcards um, and also using Anki or Quizlet. I personally recommend Anki. Um, it's quite sophisticated. Um, and also you need to do a lot of practice questions. Uh, you can find practice questions in past papers and also in your textbook. And that's really going to help you understand how to apply the knowledge that you have gained. 
And then uh, tip number three, you need to question the implications of the concepts that you learn. This is very important for both physics and chemistry because the questions that you're going to get in your exams, especially the big exams like the HSC, they are going to require you to apply your knowledge in particular scenarios. So um, you, when you learn a particular concept, you need to understand how, it, how it's affected in different situations. So in chemistry, for example, when you learn about the properties of different chemicals, you can ask yourself, what would happen if I mix these chemicals together? So would they mix? Would they react? What does the reaction look like? Um, and in physics, you should do the same thing. So with everything that you learn, you have to apply it in a, in a made up scenario and see how it would, it would, it would affect the situation. Um, and also whenever you learn a formula in physics, you need to ask yourself, if I change X, how does Y change? For example, here, what would happen to the Earth's gravitational field if its mass was halved? And this is a question that you could get in an exam. And yeah, that's it for me. I'm going to pass it on to Calvin. Thank you, Irene. I uh, love the energy and I will pass it on to Calvin. Just give me one second. Thank okay, you, Irene. Audio check and everybody can see him. Thank you. So I'll be taking you through stage six business studies. Um, so first of all, who am I? My name is Calvin, and I'm one of the students at Open Wisdom Education. I've been with Open Wisdom Education for over five years now. A little, a little background about me. I've graduated from UNSW last year, and I studied uh, Bachelor of Information Systems and Commerce. Um, I'm ex Macquarie and currently at Westpac in the risk analytics field. And as other students have done, I'll go through the business studies as a subject. Uh, I will take you through why you should take this subject if you're considering taking it, how the HSC exam is structured, and some common questions and tips for HSC and the subject in general. So why should you choose business studies? Well, firstly, business studies is a subject that prepares you very well for some um, popular university uh, majors, such as the marketing or finance and HR, like your commerce degrees. And um, business studies is divided in by business functions and supplemented by real business case studies. And in that, you will learn how business functions and using uh, business management skills and strategies solve problems. So together, you will learn to analyze contemporary business problems and communicate those findings in your reports and essays. In the HSC and or in the business studies course overview, in year 11, you will be learning three topics and that's around business management and business planning, followed by four topics in the HSC centered around four core business functions and their operations, marketing, finance, and human resources. So how is the HSC exam structured? So the exam is 100 marks, three hours with five minute reading time. The exam consists of four sections. Section one, what are the choice questions, followed by short answer questions and two extended responses, a business report and essay. Some misconceptions and FAQs. It's a, it's a myth that uh, you don't need to pay attention in 11 as it doesn't count towards uh, the HSC. Well, that's true, but um, the year 11 contents prepare you very well for the ability, for your ability to analyze problems and write essays and reports. So you do need to pay attention. As Sharon has said, other, other subjects sometimes don't count towards HSC marks, but it does prepare very well for the foundations that you're gonna pick up from year 12. Um, next, it's a fact that business studies are a very fun course with course materials that are closely related to, uh, to real life. So, that means you have to study the subject holistically rather than just trying to memorize the contents. Uh, you also have to uh, understand why you're taking, um, for example, your, um, why you're studying this unit of work, or for example, why studying this top point contribute to operations. And by doing so, it gives you an insight to how business functions, learn critical strategies and solving business problems. And um, your supplemented or your, your teacher might give you some real case studies, for example, Apple and Qantas. And third, it's a myth that business studies, it's easy because it's all about memorizing. 
And th that is a myth because um, you, you are examined on the application of thought points and how you answer the intent of the questions. So every question has an intent. So you're trying to answer that intent of the question. So don't just memorize the contents by themselves, make an effort to understand thought points. And but that way you'll write much better quality essays or reports. Some common uh, tips and tricks for fan six. Tip one, know your syllabus and that's uh, dot point. So um, no dot points inside and outside. In, um, I think I've said that try not to memorize things in, in business studies, but if there's one thing you have to memorize, then I'll say that's your syllabus dot points. Uh, HSC questions are derived from those dot points. For example, if you look at um, the objectives, financial management, and the, the, the HSC questions will directly ask you, for example, probability or growth, and that you have to memorize those dot points. Tip number two, study, uh, study in class, write quality notes, revise on notes, and then prepare for exams. And that, that's very common across the subject and that's more prevalent in business studies. So you sort of start um, writing notes, short and succinct notes in, with high quality in week one. You start revising the content as you go. And then, for example, you might add in better case studies or higher and fine knowledge as you go through the, uh, through the weeks. And by the time the exams are around the corner, you will have a very comprehensive set of notes at your disposal and you don't have to go back and check your, uh, for example, textbooks. And all you can do is refer to your notes and you don't have to find, go to find time to find your notes. Tip number three, so read the news. Um, business studies are centered around uh, answering questions and having strategies around your uh, questions using contemporary business studies. So you can read, read the AFR um, when, so, so you can start reading news from the AFR, for example, um, ABC News on the left or the ACCC, and that's which stands for Australian Competition Consumer Commission. Um, for example, the ABC reported that toll uh, truck drivers walked off their jobs. And once you read that news and you sort of say, well, how is that related to business studies? And for example, that relates to enterprise agreements, industrial relations, work health and safety, over actions of uh, human resources. On the right, you will see ACCC alleged that big telcos mislead consumers on envy and speeds. And that relates to false and misleading advertising in the marketing function of business studies. So having modern and relevant case studies will make you stand out in front of the HSC markers. And then that's more likely for you to get high marks. And that's all from me. And I'll pass the buck back to James. Excellent, Kelvin. Uh, that's uh, something, I, a lot of the contemporary examples. So I appreciate that. So to wrap up, I'll quickly go through some of the subjects we offer at Open Wisdom Education. So for maths, we offer advanced two unit, extension three unit, extension two four unit, and math standard. Across science, we have chemistry, physics, and biology. For English, we offer advanced English, standard English, EALD, as well as Extension 1 English, we started this year. And lastly, we also offer Business Studies, Economics, Japanese Beginners, and Japanese Continuous, which across all the subjects should cover roughly 80 to 90% of the subjects that our students pick. And then to wrap everything up, uh, if you're interested to book a trial lesson with us in Term 3, or if you just want to have a chat and need further assistance, there are three ways to contact us. You can either register on our website, you can email us via openwisdomeducation at gmail.com, or uh, someone just joined the meeting just about, uh, we're about to finish, but we still let them in. Uh, lastly, you can contact directly on WeChat, where we'll have a dedicated team of customer support that will answer any questions you may have. So once again, thank you for attending this uh, information seminars. I hope you learn all learn a lot to take away and we wish you all the best as you start the next year of your year 11, 12 journey. Thank you.